Pick 29 in the 2017 draft. Charlie Spargo, and there he is, taking a mark at half forward. A fantastic footy family. Inside 50 once again. And scouting is the young oh. Kicks for goal. Oh. And he's pumped. Get around him. Spargo gets his first. They're having a crack, and that's Charlie Spargo. Not surprisingly, he's in that blue too. Uh, Jason got a 19-year-old kicking from 40 metres. The drop punt is on its way, and it's good. He's got two, this young man. He just looks like an actual footy player, Chief. Doesn't he? And he does this. Our guest tonight made his debut against the Bombers in round six at Etihad Stadium and in doing so made football history, becoming the only family to have produced four successive generations of VFL, AFL players. His tenacity and hard work have seen him keep his spot in the team despite stiff competition for spots in what is a very dynamic forward line. Welcome to the Demon Land podcast, Charlie Spargo. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. So, Charlie, um, uh, we know you were me- you're meant to have moved on and you're concentrating on uh, the coming week's game against the Hawks, but you still surely must be buzzing from Friday night's win. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's easily the biggest crowd I've ever played in front of. I'm not sure about the other guys, but I think it was 91,000 around the mark, and I did take my time uh, before the game when we were running out, when I was warming up, and then towards the end when, when I thought we had it wrapped up, and then... Once the siren, got, siren went, I did take my time to savour it all in. It was pretty, pretty, pretty special moment, and I know I've, I've considered myself pretty lucky to come into a side you know, in my first year and be able to play finals. Like I was talking to Nathan Jones before the game, and and he was saying, you know, don't take it for granted because he came in and played finals in his first couple of years, and and then didn't play again for 12 years. So yeah, pretty lucky. Uh, fingers crossed that that uh, that doesn't happen again. Yeah, that's um, right. Uh, playing in front of 91,000 people, from the crowd perspective, it certainly felt like most of the crowd was barracking for Melbourne. Did you get a sense of that out on the field, that it was a, a demon's crowd? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it was when Geelong ran in to open goals a couple of times and they missed from probably 15 metres out or something like that. Um, it, it seemed like that when Geelong was missing, it was actually louder. And when when they were kicking goals, so yeah, it definitely seemed like Melbourne had a lot more people there. Oh yeah, um, for, from a, a supporter's perspective, you de- we definitely got that sense as well. Yeah. Um, Charlie, you played uh, in an elimination final in just your 16th game, which is a dr- dream come true for any youngster. Uh, what were your expectations coming into the season? Was it just to get a senior game? Um, c- could you even anticipate um, that you would be playing in September? Yeah, I I was just really hoping to play some sort of senior footy. Um, I had a shoulder injury coming into pre-season, so I wasn't sure how that would affect me in, in terms of selection, how fit I'd be coming into the season. And then uh, in my first VFL game for the year, I got suspended for a week. So I sort of didn't have much continuity earlier in the year, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to play. But, yeah, pretty lucky to come in when I did, when we started winning some games. And, yeah, very privileged to, to be playing in the finals in my first year. Were, were you nervous at all in the days leading up to uh, Friday night's game or, or during the pre-match? What was the overriding emotion uh, yeah, in, I, in the lead-up? I, I tend to not be too nervous in the, the few days before a game, but on the day of a game, I really do get nervous, especially uh, a night game. You sit around all day so waiting for it to happen. So I tried to do my best to, to get out of the house and keep my mind off it. But, yeah, it was tough. Uh, Charlie, you made your debut against Essendon in round six and you had an, account- an encounter with uh, Brendan Goddard, who it's fair to say isn't the most popular of players amongst opposition <laughs> fans. Uh, what did you say yeah. to him? <laughs> uh, no, there was actually nothing nothing said between us. It was just a bit of, a bit of jumper punching and a, yeah, a bit of a wrestle. It actually wasn't... It was, there was a contest and he sort of nabbed me, so I gave him a push and then yeah, one thing led to another. We were on the ground wrestling, but... No, nah, there was actually nothing said. It was a bit weird. Uh, you don't mind cracking in, do you? Uh, yeah, no, nah, it's not too bad. I sort of my, my dad obviously played a fair bit of footy, and so did his his dad and stuff like that. And they always taught me you can't deviate off a line of the ball. So I try my best to do that. 
you know, just on that, um, your debut created history. The Spargo's becoming the first family to produce four successive generations of players. Uh, and just for our listeners, um, to let them know, your great-grandfather, Bob Senior, played uh, 65 games for Footscray and two games for the Demons. Your yeah. grandfather, Bob Junior, played 80 games for Footscray. And your father, Paul, played 90 games uh, for North and Brisbane. Uh, you also had a great uncle, Ricky, who played um, uh, 60-odd games for Footscray in the late 60s and early 70s. It's quite a pedigree. Um, your dad was on hand at the jumper presentation ceremony uh, before the Essendon game. It must have been a, a special moment for you and the family. Yeah, it was. And, um, yeah, Dad was very proud of me that day. And I'm very grateful for, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of footy in my bloodlines and they've helped me out. Uh, a fair bit. Dad's always, you know, whenever I need advice, Dad's always, um, Dad's always helped me out with that. And then so is my grandpa Bobby. Um, never met my gra- my great grandpa, Bob Senior, but yeah, a lot of things that have been passed down from him uh, keep getting passed down to me. So yeah, pretty special that it could be fourth generation. And yes, yeah, so Dad was certainly pretty proud when I when I got to play. You talked about, uh, you know, that you don't really get nervous in the days leading up, but on game day you do. But uh, is it true that you slept in on the morning of your debut uh, and also that uh, you didn't know how to even get to Etihad Stadium? Yeah, that's right. I, I knew how to get to Etihad Stadium, but I wasn't sure. I don't, I don't think many people were sure because uh, Melbourne don't really play there that much as far as I know, but... Um, yeah, I didn't know where which car park entry to go in, so I had to follow Bailey Fritz in, who actually didn't know either, because he hadn't played there before. So, yeah, I slept in until probably about 10, which was good, less time to think about the game, and then, and then yeah, I had a bit of trouble getting in, but, but sorted it out. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, we've spoken about your footballing family. Did you always want to play um, professionally growing up? Yeah, I did. Um, Dad never put any pressure on me to play. Of course, he was always... Uh, very supportive of me in whatever I wanted to do, whether that was that was study or footy or whatever. But yeah, I always uh, felt like I wanted to play. So especially around probably when I got to probably about 16, I started playing some good footy uh, in the under 16s and the nationals, and I sort of thought that I was a bit of a chance. So I decided to put my head down and and yeah, uh, ended up getting drafted. Along the way, were you ever told that you weren't tall enough to make the grade? And if so, how did you respond to opinions like that? Um, I actually had a lot of support from, from whatever coach I had. No one ever really – I didn't really not get picked because of my height and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was pretty lucky that I didn't have many people telling me I couldn't do it. But in saying that, whenever I'm playing, I really do, don't worry about my height at all. It's more when – maybe when I was off field during my draft years and stuff like that, I was thinking perhaps they'll pick someone else ahead of me uh, because they're taller and they might project a bit better at AFL level. But – When I'm playing, I really don't worry about it at all. There's been a lot of conjecture on uh, the forum that we're all on um, about your nickname. Um, Some people think (laughs) it might be Sparky. Others call you Spartacus. Um, Can you put the debate to rest? (laughs) What do the boys call you? Uh, Yeah, I haven't heard those two uh, around the (laughs) club. They must be fan nicknames. I know, I'll get a fair few different ones. Um, Sparks has sort of been my one. I've had my whole life. That's what most people sort of catch on cause, just because of my last name. But uh, one that's been been developed this year from a few of the coaches is Jack Sparrow. I don't know where it came from, but, <laughs> yeah, I've got a fair few nicknames. It's a bit weird. <laughs> I sort of don't know what to respond to sometimes. Uh, to be fair, the one that uh, one of the ones that uh, my co-host, Jason, uh, mentioned, um, Spartacus, was we were at the... Um, we were at the Gold Coast game. You played on the Gabba, and I think there was yeah. just a drunk guy in the crowd who was calling you Spartacus. So <laughs> for, yeah. between us, that's, <laughs> that's where that, uh, that came about. Uh, there seems to be an incredible camaraderie among the playing group. Uh, where does that come from, and how do you build something like that that, that just seems so authentic and genuine? Yeah, well, I think uh, Simon Goodwin, the coach, he, he drives it a lot. He drives togetherness. That's one of our pillars. Uh, that we like to sort of pride ourselves on in our cultures is, is having, you know, being very close with one another and and togetherness sort of drives us within games. Uh, we can sort of turn to each other uh, maybe when the other team's got momentum or something and feed off each other. Um, and I, don't know, I know, you know, prior to me coming, 
uh, they've been building a culture for a while that sort of supports that. So, yeah, pretty lucky to step into it the way it is. We hear a lot these days about players playing their role. Um, what's your role specifically? Um, do you have certain KPIs you need to meet? Uh, does it change from week, week to week? What are Goody's instructions to you other than uh, obviously to bring pressure, which seems to be a, a key theme um, across the field? Um, I think well, one of my natural sort of strengths is, is my running ability and my pace and, and fitness. So um, I'm encouraged from the coaches to to run and open up space and, and work hard as much as I can. So, yeah, obviously you've got your, your traditional small forward stats such as pressure and goals. But, yeah, running and, and providing options is, is probably another thing that I'm encouraged to do. Uh, we hear a lot of thing, a lot, a lot of people sort of saying that you know the first year players sort of tire towards the end of the season. Are you finding that uh, you're getting tired towards the end of end of this season? You know, it's a long season now with finals as well. Yeah, it's, it is certainly a lot longer than I don't know, a lot of other first year players would have had before, and and you do some feel somewhat uh, fatigued, probably around from probably round eighteen to round twenty two, but. In saying that, um, the high-performance staff at Melbourne have done a lot uh, for the first-year players at Melbourne to sort of manage just because they know it's a load that we've never really had before. So if there's a part of the week where, you know, you can sort of have off or rest, they'll give it to you um, to ensure that, you know, you're at your best come game day on the weekend. And do you think your role will change in the future? Can you see yourself playing in the midfield at some stage? Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I've done a bit of work with the mids this year. I've been up on the wing, you know, a couple of times this year, but I sort of just do whatever's asked of me. I did play midfield a lot uh, when I was when I was younger, uh, in under 18s and stuff like that. So I still feel like I can, I could be a midfielder. But yeah, whatever whatever Melbourne asks of me, I'll do. Is there a senior player or players uh, who you turn to for advice? Um, probably Alex Neilborn and Jake Melksham, two of the two of the leaders in the forward line that sort of play similar roles to me. I, I like to feed off and ask questions. Tom McDonald as well, just being the general forward line leader. So uh, Alex Neilborn, he obviously a very hard worker and, and a great tackler. So uh, that's sort of the type of player I'd like to be one day. And then Jake Melsham, um, you know, he's marking craft and his one-on-one stuff's pretty good. So I sort of like to watch those two guys. Uh, one one last one uh, before we let you go. Uh, you did a Q and A with the club where you were listed as you listed rapping as your hidden talent. Uh, can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? You want to <laughs> you want to make your rapping debut on the Demon Land podcast? Um, <laughs> I will not that. make my rapping debut on the Demon Land. I don't like to share it that much. Um, I know I just like rap music in general, and we had to do some performances earlier in the year in front of everyone um, on our own. Or yeah, so. Uh, me and, and Chris Tracker and Christian Sale and Jack Finey, we, uh, we we did a rap song in front of everyone. We went pretty well. <laughs> Very nice. Well, Charlie, congratulations on the incredible debut year you've had to date. Uh, you've certainly exceeded all expectations that supporters have for any first-year player and, and then some. So best of luck for the rest of the season and beyond. We're, we're very excited with what we've seen so far and what's to come in the future. So thank you for t- your time tonight. Thanks, Jason. Andy, thanks for having me, boys. Not a problem. Thanks, mate. Cheers.